<laughs> Amen. Well, good to see everybody. If you've never met my wife and I, my name's Brother David Summerdorf, my wife, Miss Deborah, and as you can see, we're matching today, and that's so we don't get lost in the crowd. We traveled for many, many years with six children, and they were a, a, an amazing singing group, and our ministry included tent ministries across America as well. But the kids have all left now, and it's just Deb and I, but we are proud grandparents of 10, soon to be 11 grandchildren, and they're all seven and younger. So yeah, when we have a reunion, it's uh, grandpa becomes the zookeeper, so it's amazing. <laughs> But very quickly, before I go any further, if you need a handout for Sunday school, just raise your hand very quickly. My wife is going to have this. Or a pen. If you need something to write with, uh, just raise your hand. And Deb has pens as well as handouts. Some of you asked about the Corvette, and it was uh, kind of disappointing. You weren't really looking forward to seeing me. You were looking forward to seeing my car. <laughs> Uh, the Corvette is not with us. It's in the National Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky. It has been there now for almost 14 months. We'll pick it up the end of this month. It was taken on loan by Corvette, and it is in the very first group of cars in the museum as you enter and tour through it. Some of our relatives have seen it. Others have contacted me. But when I put the car in, I asked Derek Moore, who is the curator, I said, Derek, you, you know I'm a traveling minister. And as I extend to you this car, I just want to know how far can I take this? And he knew exactly what I was talking about, ministry and gospel and so forth. And he looked at me and he said, as far as you want to take it. I said, well, praise the Lord. So we already had had a prefab stainless steel pedestal done just like a lectern like this, all stainless steel, very beautifully done with a sticker description of the car, a story of the roses, and then a huge QR code. You all know what a QR code is, all right? If you're over 50, you may not, but it's that, it, it looks like one of those uh, uh, UPC codes or whatever, but you can take your phone and just put it right on that code, and it sends you to our website, gives you a four-minute walk-around DVD of the car, as well as a gospel presentation, how to be saved. And so we're very grateful. Many, many hits, hundreds of hits on our website. So as I'm working today, the car is working in the Corvette National Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So uh, we're grateful that uh, we can get the gospel out in that fashion as well. All right, raise your hand again if you need a handout, if you need a pen. All the way over, we still have a hand or two over here. Oh, we have more copies right here. Right here. That's good when you're running out. Amen. So is there, just raise your hand if you need a copy, if you need a pen. Is there passing those out? Take your Bibles and go to Joshua chapter 24. We're going to kind of be in Joshua 24, kind of the springboard text, most of the messages today. Joshua chapter 24. Want to go ahead and just read two very familiar portions of Scripture. And by the way, happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. You say, where would you be without a mother? You wouldn't be. And so happy Mother's Day. Joshua 24, verse 14. Very challenging thought. It says this. Joshua is exhorting the people. And he says this. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Notice this, but as for me, then he speaks even for those beyond him, and my house, we will serve the Lord. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. <clears throat> you know, I believe that as we look across our nation today, there are many things that are in disrepair. Notice something here, and the house of God is being spoken of, the home being addressed in Joshua, the house of God now being addressed in 1 Corinthians 14. And notice what God says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion. Could I just say this morning, our God is a God who simplifies. He doesn't confuse. Amen? 
There's a simplicity that's in the person of Jesus Christ. You either have him or you don't. If you have him, you're saved. If you don't, you're lost. Amen? There's simplicity. Our God is not the author of confusion. Notice this, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that are right unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, forbid not to speak with tongues. Notice this little statement that sums up this whole section in 1 Corinthians 14. In verse 40, he says, let all things be done decently. Look at this, and in order. I have a little thought. It's very unique. Something that just recently Deb and I had been talking about and we kind of collectively as a husband and wife put together as observers. First of all, as observers of the house of God, observers of married folk out there, observers of the younger generation and their attempts to raise children. Just observing things. And the thought I simply entitled, Out of Order. Out of Order. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning for our time to be here. We thank you for the privilege we have to call you Father, to know your Son as our Savior. Lord, as we consider this contemplative thought, Lord, I pray you'd apply it to hearts. I pray, Father, you would apply it to marriages. Lord, you'd apply it to our homes, our children, our families. And even this house we call your house, the house of God. Lord, I pray things would be done decently and in order. Lord, we pray that you would have the preeminence, that there would be peace, and Father, not confusion. Bless now and what's said and use it in our hearts and homes, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Out of order. That's an interesting thought. We've heard people say that before. Uh, they've used that phrase, out of order. And the first thing I want to notice is there are three definitions for that thought. First of all, out of order can mean out of sequence. All right? Write that in your notes. Being out of order means something can be out of sequence. If you will, not prioritized properly. We know the number one comes before the number two, not the other way around. All right? No matter how much you may want that, that means out of sequence. Second of all, out of order can mean out of control. Write that down can be out of control. Have you ever heard somebody say, young man, you are out of order? Or what do they say? You are out of control. You need to get back in control. So out of order can have that idea of being out of control. But thirdly, out of order can simply mean out of operation. Not functional, if you will. It's broken and needs to be repaired. A couple years ago, we were in Washington, D.C. We had a little mini reunion with two of our married children and all of their children. I can't, rem I can't keep track of how many grandchildren were there. I I'm losing count quickly when we get together. But nonetheless, we decided to go to the Washington National Zoo. Well, that's an interesting one. The zoo visits the zoo, all right? So we went to the Washington National Zoo, and Deb and I are there, and the little gaggle of geese, and, and all of a sudden our, our oldest grandson, Daniel, he was probably three, said, I have to go potty. And so we just landed at this place. We have no idea where the restrooms are. And so as my daughter and daughter-in-law are getting their little urchins ready, Deb volunteered, and she said, Grandma will take this, Grandma will take this, and so off she took Daniel and headed off in following signs that were pointing to the restrooms, and so they were gone for a little bit, and then all of a sudden they came back, and Daniel was in tears, and he was wet, and, and I said, what in the world happened? And Deb says, oh, hon, you'll never believe this. We kept asking people, where's the restroom? And they said, over there. And then we went and we got closer and closer. And as we turned the corner, she said, and we got to the restroom. This is what greeted us at the restroom. Out of order. 
You know, when you think of that phrase, out of order, is that positive or negative? When you hear something's out of order, what do you say? Oh, great. No, you don't do that. That, that phrase, out of order, is a very negative phrase, isn't it? I, I can't think of one time that you would say it's out of order and everybody would say, that's great. It's a very negative phrase. And it's negative because of a number of reasons. Why would, when something's out of order, why would that be so negative? Why would you have a negative response? What do out of order things create? Talk to me. Chaos, for one thing, all right? What else? They can become, let's say this, Daniel was very embarrassed because that was out of order. You know what I'm saying? It can be embarrassing when something's out of order, amen? It can be very expensive when something's out of order. Would you agree with that? And so out of order is not positive, it's negative. And it's negative because it's costly, it's chaotic, it's expensive, and it also can be something that's very embarrassing. Now, the thought I have for you this morning is not some expository thought through Scripture, but it's something that hit us, Deb and I, as we've grown in our walk with the Lord, as we've watched the generations, we've begun to notice there are things out of order that shouldn't be out of order. First of all, out of order, write this in, spiritually. There are things today that are out of order spiritually. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Notice this, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus Christ sets a focus, a priority, an emphasis. He gives us the priority of what ought to be number one in our lives in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33. In Matthew 6, Jesus Christ is speaking of concerns that people have. And uh, notice what he says in uh, verse number 31. He says this in Matthew 6, 31, Wherefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first what? the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then let me paraphrase, and all that other junk you worry about will get added unto you. You know, I'm watching, even in our churches today, an out-of-order situation spiritually, where the emphasis isn't always on the spiritual, it's on the physical and the material and the temporal things. Amen? I could say this, in the area of salvation, write that in there. I see many times people get this out of order spiritually concerning salvation. When you think of good works, Ephesians chapter 2 gives us the priority. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, what? Not of works, lest any man should boast. You know that good works are good, but... Good works aren't what gets you saved. You get saved and good works follow. Amen? That's the proper order. I grew up in a home where you tried to work your way to heaven. You tried to get good enough to bribe your way into heaven. You tried to do certain things to merit God's favor and then not do things that would pull the plug on the righteousness account. You know what I'm saying? I'll tell you something. If you're here this morning, maybe you're here visiting, and you say, you know, I'd sure like to get to heaven. Let me tell you something. If you're looking for something to do, if you're looking for some righteous act to accomplish, to bribe your way into God's heaven, you're 2,000 years too late. It already got done at Calvary. You cannot better that sacrifice. You cannot live a sinless life Jesus lived. You've already blown past that opportunity. Amen? You cannot die a sinless death that Jesus died. You can't try to get to heaven. You need to trust him to get to heaven. It has already be done, been done. Look and live. Amen? You know, you get that out of order spiritually, and you'll pay for that very costly. You'll pay for that with your soul. You try to work your way to heaven instead of trust Jesus Christ. Amen? There's an out of order spiritually in the area of service today. Look in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, 
I'm just moving my way. This is meant to be a reflective, searching, contemplative thought. It is the weirdest Sunday school I've ever taught. I'm just going to tell you that. But it's a thought. I want you to think. I want you, you should be thinking to yourself right now, what could be out of order in my life? What could be out of order in my What could be out of order in my heart? These are thoughts I want you to be thinking as we move our way through the topics. Uh, in the area of service, Luke chapter 10, look at what's said in verse number 38. Luke 10 and verse 38. This is Mary and Martha. And notice what's said here. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village. A certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Notice Martha in verse 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. You can almost hear his tone of voice. Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good thing, that good part which shall not be taken away from her. You know, you look at Mary and Martha. Martha was a servant. There was no doubt about it. Mary served as well. But let me tell you something. The priority that Jesus Christ was putting and the emphasis was on not doing, but being. Amen? Being. I think Deb has a book that he, she recommends to many ladies, and it's a great read. It said, having a merry heart in a Martha world. Has anybody ever read that book? Anybody ever read that? That's a good book. It, it, okay, having a merry heart in a Martha world. You know, we love just doing things. Busy, 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 preoccupied Americans, and that whole attitude comes into our Christianity, and all too often we don't take time to remember to just sit at Jesus' feet and to worship the one who saved us. Listen, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Amen? And a relationship requires time and attention. Amen? You and I can do a lot in our strength of our flesh, but we can do more with the Lord. Amen? And you don't want to get that out of order. You want to have the right order, a relationship first, and then serve in the strength of your Savior. Amen? Out of order spiritually. Let me just say this. This is going to tweak you and make you think. Out of order spiritually in the area of even our prayer life. We are trichotomous beings, aren't we? Right? Tell me, tell me the three parts. What are we? We're what? Body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. And that's always the order we say it. But if you go to 1 Thessalonians 5, God reverses the order. Spirit, soul, and body. Think of your prayer requests. Look at your prayer request list. I'm, I haven't even looked. I have no idea. All too often, all we do is pray for the body, pray for our health, pray for our healing, pray for the physical things, Pray for this, pray for that. You rarely find those requests in Scripture. The body is cursed and going back to the dust. You can pray over it all you want. That thing is cursed and it's going to die. Amen? And he may give you a temporary stay of execution, but you know you already got a new body on the other side in Jesus Christ. Amen? You are already healed. He's just waiting for the body to catch up with you. Amen? That one that's on the other side. Man, we should be praying for sinners to come under conviction, for, for homes to be strengthened and walk with Jesus Christ, and, and, and for souls to be saved, and Christians to grow spiritually and get their eyes off the world. Those are spiritual requests. And I think a lot of times we, we get things out of order. We emphasize the physical, even in our prayer life rather than the spiritual and the eternal. Amen? Out of order spiritually. Number two, out of order, write this one in, emotionally. Just write that in. I'm just going to throw that one out. Out of order emotionally. In other words, out of control. And everybody here says, well, I'm never out of control. Really? I'd love to listen to you in rush hour traffic. 
You know, I'd love to hear how you operate when something blindsides you. Remember, when I was here last time, I preached a thought called Abide in Him, and I used a little sponge as the illustration. It's amazing what comes out of us when our little sponge gets squeezed. We're not as spiritual as we think we are. Amen? And many times our little sponge gets squeezed, and ah-ha, we get out of control attitudinally and emotionally. Amen? Go to Proverbs. We'll give you an example here. Proverbs 25. Would, you, would this morning, as you think about this, say, yeah, I've, I've been out of control this week, emotionally and attitudinally. Maybe attitudinally would be the better description rather than emotionally. But I think we understand that. They, they, that's a descriptive word. But notice in Proverbs 25, Look at an example how God it does, he is concerned about our attitudes, what kind of spirit we walk around with. In Proverbs 25, look at what he says in verse number 28. Scripture says this, he that hath no rule, Proverbs 25, 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Wow. What is that talking about? The spirit of what? What's it talking about? The spirit of what? Anger. He that hath no rule over his own spirit. In other words, he can't control his temper. I'm just looking. I'm just seeing if anybody blinks here, all right? <laughs> Scripture says that, that literally that kind of individual that can't control, they're out of control, they, they have a temper, literally they become this city that is broken down and without walls. What does that mean? They're open and vulnerable to any criticism. Amen? Been there, done that. You know, the spirit of anger is not godly. It's ungodly. That out of control, even Scripture says even the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. That out of control spirit, kicking things, yelling, losing it, screaming at, at somebody, getting angry, that is, that is very embarrassing. That's very expensive. And frankly, it's very costly because you lose relationships when you live that way. Amen? Guys seem to struggle with that more than ladies do but it's not limited to just men. You and I should always be in control of our emotions rather than the other way around. Amen? Deb uh, is just about done writing a book for ladies, and it's frankly a very challenging book. It, I can't believe it. She's going to publish something before I do. I'm the writer. I just hate writing. It's just a lot of work. You know, but she's probably a, a few months out from getting that published, but it's a very challenging thought, and that's one of the things she'll challenge ladies is, ladies, you have no right to act like that. I don't care what you're going through. I don't know where you care what age you are, whatever. You have a responsibility to carry yourself as a daughter of the king. Amen? You and I need to recognize that. There's nothing godly about being out of order, out of control emotionally. Look at James chapter 3, and then I'll go to my third point in James chapter 3. James chapter 3 gives us the focus <clears throat> and how you and I should carry ourselves as, as uh, believers. In James chapter 3, in verse number 13, he says this in James 3.13, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? James 3.13. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Watch verse 14 now. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Isn't that just powerful? 
You see the two hands. You see something that's carnal and out of control. And then you see all of this other fruit and this spirit and this attitude that is under the control and submission of Jesus Christ. Amen? Out of control emotionally. Thirdly, write this one in. I'm watching this happen. I'm seeing an out of order positionally occurring in homes across America today. Out of order positionally. What am I speaking of? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. A positional out of order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, you will find the only verse in your entire Bible that gives God's chain of command and due order of the entire universe. Here it is, 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3. He says this, but I would have you know, 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Wow. Four entities. Who is primary uh, headship? Who's the top of the, the leadership ladder? God the, Father. God the Father. Who's next? God the Son. Then who's next? The man, and we would say the husband, and then the woman or the wife. That's God's due order. You say, well, I don't like God's due order. That's the problem with society today. They don't like God's order. Amen? They are reinventing all the order. I mean, weird reinventions, wicked reinventions. They don't want God to say this is how it's ordered. Now, it has nothing to do with value. It has everything to do with order. How I know that is, who's more valuable, God the Father or God the Son? Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God, equal in value, different in order. This is why he says to the wife, wives, submit. Well, you say those two words in Walmart today. Just stand there as people walk in. Wives, submit. Wives, submit. Wives, you submit. All you're doing is quoting two verses from the Bible. Society goes, ah, just freaks. And it isn't society, man. You can say that in a church, and it's like, whoa, you can just feel the attitude. I'm going to tell you something. Society's got it out of order. Amen? They don't know how to build happy homes. God does. Amen? God has a due order. The husband is the head of the house, not the wife. I mean, we read that in 1 Corinthians 11. If, in fact, in the area of, of, of church, the, the men have leadership roles. The, if the woman has a question, she goes and asks her husband at home. It endorses God's chain of command and his leadership and his due order that he has set for this universe. That's sure not popular today, is it? But it is true. And guys, I know we love to hear this. Oh, yeah, look at you know. But then he turns to us and say, husbands, you love her and die for her. Amen? So that's yeah, another message. But anyhow, you got to get that in order too, guys. You remember my family series, to make it work, you got to mind your own business, you know. Focus on what God gave you for your command. Don't worry about their command. But I'm watching this out of order positionally. I'm seeing roles get reversed in homes today. Men are no longer the leader. They're just the boy. Mom leads, and he just follows. You know, that can work for a while, but it always is an upside-down wedding cake, and sooner or later that thing topples and creates problems. Amen? And then I'm watching an out-of-order positionally in the house of God. Look in Hebrews chapter 13 real quickly, and I'll go to our final point. Hebrews chapter 13. This is the church with the buzzer and the bell. I remember that. It's like I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get ahead of that thing. I heard that thing go announcing our entrance, and I went, oh, man, that's right. I'm going to get ahead of this. I'm not going to get caught off guard by the five-minute warning. Notice here in, in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews is a, in chapter 13, a very interesting chapter. Three places you're commanded to do something concerning the man of God. In Hebrews chapter 13, in verse number 7, you're to remember them. Hebrews 13, 7. That would be pray for your pastor in Hebrews 13, 7. In Hebrews uh, 13, uh, 24, it says what? Salute 
all them that have the rule over you. And that would be speaking of respect them. Amen? They have an office they hold. You need to respect that. And then thirdly, look at verse 17. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. You know, in the house of God, the pastor is the under shepherd. Amen? That's God's due order. And then the men are in leadership positions. That's God's due order. That's just how he wants it ordered, and it operates best that way. Amen? He wants that order. He wants that sequence. So I'm watching things get out of order spiritually. I'm watching things in homes and society get out of order emotionally. I'm watching things get sometimes out of order positionally. But third, fourthly, write this one, in out of order, I close with this, generationally. I'm watching an out of order situation occur generationally. Let's just pause and think about each of us for a moment. Think about you. Think about me. Just who are you? Well, when you entered earth, you began as a child. Did you know that? You didn't begin as a parent. You started as a child. I know some children think they're the parent, but you begin as a child with a parent. Amen? I mean, we, we start as a child, and then as we grow up, that, that next role that we would have would be a husband or wife, and then that generally, almost always, produces and turns us into what? Parents. All right? So we're a child first, then we're a parent. And then after parenting, what do we become? Not insane, okay, but what do we become? We become what? Oh, grandparents, I love it. I mean, they are God's reward to you for not killing your children. I mean it. It's, grandparenting is phenomenal. But I'm watching something happen, and Deb and I were, we were discussing this as well, and I'm watching a situation occur today that's out of order. First of all, number one, I'm watching parents wanting to continue to be children. I'm watching this. They don't want to grow up. Dads don't want to just be a boy and play the video games. They don't want to be responsible and man up. They don't want to lead. They want to be led because they, yes, my love. And they don't want, they just want to be children, especially men today. They don't want to grow up. Well, I, I, sometimes I feel like putting on my Marine Corps, you know, and just looking at some of these punks and saying, you little creep, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> you were born to lead. You were born to be a man. Man up. I can't stand watching her pay the bill at the restaurant. I'm sorry. That's what you're there for, big boy. You take her out. She doesn't take you out. You know what I'm saying? I can't stand watching. I just, I won't go. It's just ridiculous. It's a role reverse today. Men don't want to grow up. They want to live with their parents in their basement until they're 47, you know? And if you are, and that's, that's how it happened because of providential circumstances, I'm not slamming you. But if you're there because you just don't want to get a job and be a man, yeah, that's weird. It's weird. I don't understand that. I just don't understand that. I'm watching parents just want to be children today. They don't want to parent. Could I say this? Every child should be trained to obey. You're not called to be their bud and their friend. Every child should be trained to obey. That infers parents have to train them to obey. You say, but I have, oh, hmm. I can train a dog how to obey. Parents want to be kids. They don't want to be responsible and take the time to train. I'm watching that today. And this young generation, could I just throw it out for free if you're newly married? Don't get your wisdom from your peers. Nowhere in Scripture does it tell you to find wisdom this way or this way. It tells you to find wisdom this way. You go to God and you go to the generations ahead of you and 
zip it and ask them, how can I raise my children? And you ask the generations ahead of you to train you and help you train them. Yeah, yeah, some of you are nodding because you know exactly. We got a problem on our hands. The young generation does not want to go to the old generation and ask how to raise their children. They go to their peers and commiserate. Number one, parents want to continue to be children. But number two, here probably is the crux of it. Parents wanted to be grandparents first. Isn't that an interesting, profound thought? Parents wanting to be grandparents first. Isn't that what we're seeing today? I'm watching it. All they want to do is spoil them. All they want to do is, is manage them and make them happy. And they don't want to discipline them. They don't want to say no. They don't want to have rules. They don't want to train them. You know what? They want to be grandparents first. That is out of order. You got a parent before you become a grandparent. And in fact, something Deb and I have noticed is, is if you decide you're going to be a grandparent first rather than a parent, you are going to create a lot of cost, and you're going to get very embarrassed, and there are going to be some prices here you wish you never would have paid. What am I watching? First of all, I'm watching in the area of cost, children risk being saved. They may never get saved. What does Scripture say? <laughs> hey, you know, I, I love how God words things. If thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Dr. Spock would not like that statement, okay? But I mean, that has a picture, doesn't it? That's like, wow, that's intense. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, he says it a second time, and do what? Shalt deliver his soul from hell. What he's saying is simply this. You were here when I preached years ago, the three hours of child rearing. They're being taught respect for authority. They respect authority and fear the consequences because one day they're going to meet the authority of all authorities. He's a holy God that hates their sin, and he has the power to grind them to powder if they're on the wrong side of him, not on the right side. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's very little respect for authority today, and it's parents that have failed us, not children. The first thing that happens is there's the possibility that child will never get saved because what do you need Jesus for? God's just somebody to swing with and have fun. He's not holy. Number two, I've watched this. Parents, they bring their parents shame and not rest or joy. They shame and embarrass their parents. Isn't that what an out-of-order thing does? It's very embarrassing, like Daniel with his wet pants. It's very embarrassing when things get out of order. It's shameful. It's discouraging. And thirdly, grandparents can't enjoy them because grandparents are being forced to act like parents when they get around their grandchildren. Can anybody say amen to this? Maybe this was a good Sunday school lesson. <laughs> Deb and I, Deb has a little saying. She says to the kids, she says, say it. I can't remember how you word it. The <laughs> I promise, you promise. What? That's it. You raise them in such a way that I'll never be embarrassed to be with them. And I promise to never return them to you in such a way that you're embarrassed they were, or ashamed that they were with me. Is that right? And so as we look at this thought this morning, the first thing I want to cap it with is this. This phrase, out of order, is not negative, or is not positive, it's negative. There's nothing good that comes from out of order. And the second thing is this, 
I was walking through the motor home a while ago, and I heard this chirp. I went, what in the world is that? We got a bird clock on the wall. I said, didn't sound like the bird clock. And then a little later, chirp. What is that? And then I was out of the motor and come back, chirp. I said, what is going on? And I finally said, damn. I said, what am I hearing? She says, she, she listening and goes, oh, that's the smoke detector. The batteries are going bad. And so before they actually are completely drained and gone, it starts chirping at you. What it's doing is saying, hey, you need some attention given here. Hey, chirp, you need to give some attention. So my question as I close is this. What's chirping in your home? What's chirping in your marriage? Something out of order in your marriage? What's chirping in your attitude? Is something out of order in your personal attitude and behavior? What's chirping in your family as you look at the downlight? What's chirping in the house of God? God is very faithful to give us little chirps and little taps to correct things that are out of order. The problem is most of us would rather be ruined by praise than rescued by criticism. We'd rather just throw the smoke detector away that's chirping instead of invest in a new battery and get something changed. Amen? Now, here's the thing. On the back of that is a little, on the back is a questionnaire. Do that on your own. It'll help your home. It's feedback. It's feedback to breakfast of champions. Out of order. Never positive. It's out of sequence, out of control, or out of operation. Our God is not the God of confusion. He's the God of peace. Let all things be done decently and in order. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this thought. I pray you'd use it somehow in hearts and homes that are here. Bless the service to follow now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Lord bless you. You're dismissed.